It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Thanks for being here, friends. My name is Mike Bernard. I'm your host. I'm also one of the certified financial planners on the program. With me in the KFG studios, two CFPs like normal, just a slight change, Josh Gregory and special guest CFP CPA Ryan Fair. Yeah, good to have you here, Ryan. Morning, guys. Well, listen, when you filed your taxes last year, did you have any nasty tax surprises? It seems as though there are more of those happening this year than in years past. So what are the reasons for the increased number of tax issues? How can you avoid them? And what can you do if you face the worst one of them all, the dreaded IRS notice? We're covering that and more on this episode of The Wise Money Show. That's right. Some of these were infused from questions from, from fans, and we may get to questions later in the program. If you have a question, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to help. Obviously, if you're facing a tax surprise or or had a, a poor tax experience this year, we'd love to help. You can call or text us 574-222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. Online, wisemoneyshow.com, and then all over social media. Wherever you're at, we are there as well. Search The Wise Money Show. Welcome back, Ryan. Ryan is uh, one of our CPAs on the team. Not one of you know, like he is the man. Like we, wow. he leads a great team and does a fantastic job and uh, has been doing taxes. Is it fifteen years? Yeah, since he was in diapers. 15, 15, 16, sixteen. Sixteen since yeah. he was in diapers. <laughs> That's true. Thank you. <laughs> and and, uh, and at, at KFG, we've been doing taxes now twenty years. Is yeah. that right? And yep. so we've seen a lot. Now we've. We were talking with another, let's just say finance firm, about a month ago, and they started doing taxes a couple years ago, but they do a decent amount, and they were just going on and on about how many of their clients faced huge tax surprises this year. Just when they delivered the return, just utter disbelief. And I'm going to tell you right now, this company, even though they're in finance, they don't do financial planning. They don't do tax planning, so I'll let the cat out of the bag right there. But they just went on and on about how many surprises there were. And I thought, yeah, actually, there were a lot of surprises this year. Guys, what what made 2021 unique? Why were there more tax surprises on this year's tax return than in years past? I think you just hit it, right? Uh, So many people in... I guess in the United States in general, they, they kind of go with the flow as it pertains to their taxes. And the flow has been choppy. It has been changing. There's plenty of tax law changes, new opportunities that are out there, new surprises that are just happening out there. So if, if you're not taking a proactive approach to uh, your, your tax picture, your overall financial life, then of all the years, you know, Congress and uh, the IRS, they've been throwing plenty of curveballs out there. And uh, if, if you weren't ready for them, then unfortunately, you don't even discover it until it's time to file your taxes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this year we saw a number of, you know, very specific things that were related to the government and Congress and changes that, that were that were released for this year related to the pandemic and all the uh, different, you know, programs that, that yeah. so the yep. spending. So. Yep. So yeah, specifically this year they changed up the child tax credit. So they increased it, but they prepaid a bunch of it. So people mm-hmm. with kids were getting checks in the mail or money mm-hmm. direct deposited into their bank account uh, each month for the second half of 2021. And then when we did the tax return, we had to reconcile those payments. So if dependents changed, so did the tax return with the stimulus payments that were received in advance. And um so yeah, I caught a lot of people off guard. I had one scenario, and maybe this is you as well. Uh, individual it got fifteen hundred dollars advanced on their child tax credit, and they owed a thousand bucks on their taxes. Now, had they not gotten that in advance, they'd gotten a tax refund like they are used to. Mm-hmm. Here's the problem: they are used to about a two or three thousand dollar tax refund. So they had some other things change, and we'll get into this in just a moment. They had some other things change that was going to make their refund even smaller. But they actually owed because they'd gotten this child tax credit in advance. And that was, yeah, that was a big surprise. Yeah, I mean, it was a year ago that we were warning a lot of people, just because they're sending you money, it doesn't mean that it's really yours, right? They're, they're not really, 
they, they don't know what your financial life is going to be from right. year to year. They just know what it was last year when you filed your return. And based on that, they were sending out this money because they wanted people spending it. Mm-hmm. And it, it was meant to be an economic stimulus. And unfortunately, it worked. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of people spent that money, whether it was really theirs or not. And yeah, you saw one of the uh, mm-hmm. the horror stories, I guess, where people were surprised and had to pay it back at tax time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Another thing we saw over the last two years, maybe not just last year, but over the last two years, unemployment played a big part in these tax returns. So yeah. they created surprises for people that, you know, luckily most people have tax with tax withhold withheld from their their unemployment distributions, but yeah. it caught a lot of people off guard if they didn't have taxes withheld. Well, spe- speaking of speaking of uh, unemployment. Last year in particular, as we were getting out of the pandemic, and it's it's so crazy to think about. I feel like we've lived a lifetime in the past three years. Mm-hmm. It, it, mm-hmm. So much has changed. We've gone full circle here. So it went from everyone was on unemployment to now everyone's got a job and, uh, and everyone wants to change jobs. Mm-hmm. And so last year was the year to change jobs, it felt like. And when you change jobs, you possibly are changing your withholdings significantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw, I I think that's another reason a lot of people saw surprises is when you go from one job to another, even if you think, oh yeah, I remembered how I filled out my W-4, I, you know, filled out this way or that way. Remember guys, they just changed the withholding system. And under your previous employer, if you were there for a long time, they might still have had you withholding under the old system. And then you switch jobs and all of a sudden that pushes you into the new system and that changes your withholdings completely. Yeah, for sure. And especially these days with technology, direct deposit, you know, a lot of us (laughs) take it for granted. The money shows up in your bank account. Sweet. I've got it to spend. Without ever looking at a pay stub, well, you know, you can get them at your fingertips, but nobody ever does. Yeah. And then they get their W-2 and bring it in to me for tax prep. And, hey, did you notice that you had, you know, hardly any withholdings this year yeah. on your paycheck? Oh, no. Boom. Well, there, there's our first action item then for, for the yeah. weekend, right? If, if you haven't analyzed or just reviewed one of your own pay stubs in a long time, you know, we're just past the halfway point of the year. Maybe now is the time to just pause and say, all right, if I withheld this same amount for the second half of the year that I did in the first half, how does it compare to what I did last year? And uh, this is just doing something as simple as that, just comparing to last year. Sometimes it, it catches mistakes early enough that you can deal with it and not have that nasty surprise at tax time next next spring. So, Ryan, I saw this one with a, a friend of mine um, last year also uh, because so many people were changing jobs yep. um, and because we were seeing inflation, a lot of people got pay raises or a one-time sort of bonus. So had an individual that got a pay raise and it was substantial. I think it was 10 grand, something like that. So meaningful amount. And, um, and the withholding percentage that they were withholding was about the same. But this Mm -hmm. extra income was all at the higher tax bracket. So Mm -hmm. she's in the 22% tax bracket, and this extra income then would all be taxed at 22%. The problem is her effective withholding was close to 16%. Mm -hmm. And so this added income, sure, she had more withheld, but it wasn't enough because she had now more income taxed at higher brackets, and it it moved her from getting refund to owing. Mm -hmm. Is that something you see often as well? Yeah, definitely. We see that exact scenario, but then also depending where the clients are at in the tax brackets, it could reduce part of their child tax credit. It could take away education credits. It could be a total double whammy uh, that that gets people without, you know, catches them off guard if you're not planning. Yeah, that's right. So so the the pay raise that maybe you got last year, the bonus, the one time bonus, or maybe I, I don't know, a couple of times, or, or I heard a few scenarios where people got a bonus midway through the year and another one at the end of the year, something like that. That can change your tax picture significantly. And even if you look and say, oh, they withhold a lot from that, can change it significantly. We've got some more tax surprises unique to last year, but then also what are the most common surprises and how do you avoid them? We've got that more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Hello, YouTube. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show. What you're watching right now is our weekly one-hour talk show that airs right here on this channel, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, every Saturday morning, also on podcast at the same time 
also on a few local radio stations where we're headquartered. And that's why the content is a full hour. If you're interested in more content or more bite-sized chunks, maybe eight to 10 minutes long, uh, make sure you subscribe to this channel as well because we've got Next Y Step videos that air all throughout the work week, taking one finan financial concept, applying it directly to your financial life. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. Turn on notifications so you're made aware every time we drop new content. And if you like the content, like the content. Thank you very much. Okay. That's good. <clears throat> I'm not talking very smooth today. I don't know what is happening. There's some <laughs> sort of, I, uh, I think there's a clog in the <laughs> in the filter between my brain and my mouth. You need to clean it. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So. Can I move the mic like slightly closer to you? Sure can. Eat that thing. Eat it. Is it cake? No, it's not. <laughs> no, that's a microphone. <laughs> it's like that Uber Eats commercial or whatever. Have you seen any of those things where, like, I saw one recently. I is probably on Facebook, which I shouldn't have been on anyway. Where, like, there were like these three tacos in front of this person, and it's like, is it cake? And they're going down, and, doing, and, and then she just bites the table. <laughs> bites the table. The table was cake. It wasn't even the tacos at all. What? I'm serious. Like, I. I Dude, my kids watch that stuff on YouTube. Yeah. Like where they slice in the stuff. That yeah. Crazy. crazy. Yep. It's creative. The, the things that uh, entertain us. Yep. All right. Um, we got to hit mutual fund capital gain distributions for last year. Ryan, I don't know if there's anything else specific to last year that kind of goofed things up a little bit. Do you say anything about the side hustles? and? Yeah, we can. Just yep. that, how, how to stay organized, you know, throughout the year. So we'll hit, we'll hit maybe those two things and then like, okay, let's take a step back. What are the three most common reasons or what are the most common reasons people have a tax surprise period? And that's where side hustle or, or owning a business. So, all right, second segment. Let's get into it. What are the most common tax surprises that you can face? But gosh, more importantly, how do you avoid those surprises in the first place, we're helping you with that right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KF2 studios, Josh Gregory and special guest Ryan Fair. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on podcast wherever you listen. Just search the Wise Money Show wherever you're at. And do me a favor, when you're there, rate the program. Rate the program, subscribe to it, follow it, but rate the program. That gives helpful feedback to us and also helps other folks that are looking for wise financial content find us as well. So, okay, we're talking about nasty tax surprises, okay? And we're going to hit the nastiest one coming up in just a bit. But what are some other unique tax surprises that were unique to 2021? Josh, we were just talking about one. Go ahead. Well, it, it's not entirely unique to 2021, but it was a revisit from the past. Yeah. And it has to do with mutual funds. And, you know, most people, they invest in mutual funds inside their 401k at work, or maybe they have an IRA or a Roth IRA that they own these things in. And by, by owning mutual funds inside of a tax shelter like that, you're protecting yourselves from the normal effects of, of taxation on those mutual funds. But if you just bought it in a brokerage account or just bought it directly with a mutual fund company and it was held in just your name, not inside any of those tax shelters or anything, maybe you held it jointly with your spouse or something, then all the normal rules apply. And it's different. You know, when, when those mutual funds make money, it's going to have some kind of an impact on your, on your tax picture. And one of the big ones, the ones that surprise people, have to do with these capital gains distributions. And uh, the thing you need to understand about mutual funds is that they don't pay taxes. They are a pass-through entity. So whatever money they generate for you, it's going to land on your tax return, not on theirs. And, and that's actually a good thing because then your investments aren't paying tax only for you to turn around and pay tax as well. It's just happening one time. That's good. But the, the problem is it's difficult for people to forecast what kind of an impact the mutual funds investments, all the good stuff that's happening kind of under the hood there, you don't learn about it until the end of the year or maybe even after the end of the year when you get your 1099s and they report to you, hey, guess what? Here's how much income you get to pay tax on. Right. And so it, it can really surprise people. And when you have a year... Uh, you know, at the end of a long run, long history of stocks running up and those mutual funds are buying and selling and generating profits or capital gains, as we would call them, that's going to that's going to eventually catch up to you. And uh, if you're not prepared for it, if you're not watching for it, 
then uh, the surprise comes at tax time. And Ryan, you get to be the bearer of bad news sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah, I get to have lots of those conversations, it seems like. Uh, yeah, and a lot of times the clients, you know, the conversation will go, well, I didn't even sell anything. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what you think, capital gains. are like, well, yeah, you're right. You didn't sell anything, but the mutual fund managers did, mm-hmm. created capital gains, and that passes through to you. You pay tax on it. I mean, the, the worst part of this is when you receive when you're told that there were capital gains and you've got to pay tax on it after the market's been down for six months. I mean, yeah. the market started going down last October. You're doing your taxes in March, and and gosh, by March, what the market was already down 10 percent for the year, and you're looking saying, oh, I've got to pay tax now mm-hmm. on capital gains that have disappeared. Mm-hmm. So the last time we saw this, and and we've been warning you about this, gosh, for probably a year. Last year, the rally was going on, but underneath the surface, there had very little market breadth, and I can't even pronounce that word, but it wasn't it wasn't a broad advance. The index was advancing, but it was led by only a few areas, and there was a lot of choppiness. And if you're running a mutual fund, if that's just your if that's your job, you likely are starting to make a lot of moves because that's oftentimes a precursor to, hey, some some troubling times could be ahead. Mm -hmm. And so these mutual funds had a huge rally. They then started making lots of changes. And then, of course, the stock market then has has kind of stubbed its toe since then. And that's created capital gains for you. One other thing that has done really well, stubbed its toe and caused tax problems, Ryan, cryptos. Cryptocurrencies. What, What about that surprise for last year? Yeah. So crypto, you know, a lot of people had fun playing with crypto and it's not as fun these days but last year there were some people that did cash in and actually sold off you know sold off some of their capital gains and had to pay tax on on those gains um you know it's not a surprise necessarily but again it's a surprise often uh the the other side effects that the increased capital gains Mm. could cause yeah I, i think actually a lot of people started investing in crypto without fully understanding crypto but also not fully understanding that it was going to be taxable they thought you know there was some there was some propaganda out there saying well this is a currency it's a currency and therefore Mm -hmm. it's not going to be taxed you can just buy and sell willy-nilly and and a lot of these companies ryan you and i had some radio spots that we did where you know a lot of these companies weren't even issuing 1099s and so you thought well this is tax-free i don't need to worry about this no 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 secret blockchain nobody knows yeah that's right (laughs) that's right uh, you know, add a little bit of insult to injury on that. If you're trading and it's all short term as well, mm-hmm. you, you have to realize that that capital gain income, it's all going to land on your tax return, but how it gets treated depends on how long you held the underlying investment. And if you held it for less than a year, then those are short term capital gains and they're taxed at your highest rate. It's as if you, it's almost as if you had earned it on a paycheck. It, it's treated as ordinary income. So holding how long you hold your investments is also a key to to you know determining how much of a tax bite Uncle Sam is going to get. Something related. This is maybe off topic, but we see uh, something that popped in my mind called wash sales mm-hmm. related to crypto. But then also just those that are trading, you know, they think, well, I'm not going to owe any tax because I lost all this money. But they're it's a wash sale where they're not allowed to because they bought it back too quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Uh One other thing. And again, this isn't unique to last year, but it is unique to last year. A lot of people started like a side hustle, a side job. This has been a trend over the past couple of years, really even since the pandemic. But last year, as there were labor shortages, if you have a special skill and it was in demand and people started saying, Oh, you can do that for me. Can you help? You might have had some side income and, not really thinking I, I hear this one a lot well that's just cash money oh i understand that's cash money you still need to report it unfortunately and uh and and the taxes on that not only do you pay you know federal income tax and state and local if if that applies to you but you're also subject to self-employment tax on that which is nasty 15.3 percent as well mm-hmm. adds so up in a hurry it does yeah this is an area where having a good organization a good plan on how you're going to track things like your business expenses and all that income that's flowing in, it will make the job of filing your taxes a whole lot easier come come spring. And unfortunately, a lot of people, it's it just sort of sneaks up on them. You know, mm-hmm. the the side hustle takes off and it actually grows into a a true business, but they don't have the accounting function in place to be able to track. Yeah, where did this money go? And ho- hopefully, they at least 
had had the most basic form of of um, organization in place, and they that was a separate bank account that they ran everything through, so that at least you have history of transactions. That's but wishful thinking. I, I know. I'm I'm <laughs> telling you, it's 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 a surprise, right? Yeah. I mean, there, a lot of people they figure out, oh my, it's March, and I need to pull together a whole bunch of data that I haven't organized. Hey, one other Mike that I just thought of that um, I think you've done entire shows or uh, Wise Money Minutes on is related to the pandemic retirement distributions from a couple years ago. Mm. We saw some clients that got surprised. Uh, We had to remind them that, hey, you took out a retirement distribution in 2020. You only had to pay tax on a third of that that year. But that means the next third is taxable in 2021. The next third is 2022 if you haven't repaid any of that. So Mm -hmm. that's retirement uh, yeah. income that shows up on their tax return with no withholdings and it yeah. created uh, some surprises. I, I got in an argument with a, with a client. I I don't get in an argument with a client, but what, were they... A friendly I, debate. I, I, yeah. I, showed, I showed them that and they said, no, I didn't do that. And I said, uh, yeah, 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 you yeah, did. Yeah. And they said, no, I didn't. And like they were, they were getting mad. And and so I had to backpedal and then just show them the document because, yeah, that... If it, if I didn't do it yesterday, I probably didn't do it, right? That's, that didn't really happen, and, and yes, adds up. Okay, so guys, really, all the discussion about tax surprises, how do you avoid them, and then what do you do if you get the nasty of, of, of tax surprises, that tax notice? That and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Okay, we've had so, a so lot. they eventually concede and recognize yeah. or yeah. remember? Yeah. Oh. It was like after the, I told them. No, you didn't, like sternly. And it's like, well, or no, I didn't, you know. And then uh, I said it again, and they got really like, no, I didn't do that. No, I didn't. Like, thought, okay, you are making a mistake. And I say, hang on, hang on. And I just had my TV screen up, and I just pulled it up. I'm like, okay, so here's what happened. Here was the email where we even talked about this, blah, blah, blah. And and you're like, okay. And thankfully, the spouse was there as well. And she, it (laughs) triggered in her her right away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, can you imagine? I, th- there's plenty of times where you don't remember a certain event, and a lot of people's mind goes, "Am I getting scammed here? Yeah. You know, did mm-hmm. someone take a withdrawal out of my account somehow, or or whatever?" But I don't know. That, okay, that so stuff. we've done two segments on surprises. Do we even mention like the most common surprises, or we start getting into, "Hey, here's how you." I I think we need to get into, "Hey, here's how you avoid it," and and maybe in when yeah. I'm kind of teeing that up, I can mention here are some of the most common ones. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I will, but yeah, let's let's get into here's how you solve it. And and do we have to get to the tax notice in this segment? No, we no. can get we can get to it in four segments. Okay. Fine. So <clears throat> all right, here we go. Do you have a tax surprise last year? Do you remember having a tax surprise in the past? How do you avoid it? Those are just awful, awful experiences. How do you avoid it? We're helping you with that right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Josh Gregory and special guest, Ryan Fair. Stay up to date on all Wise Money content. Find us online, wisemoneyshow.com, and then all over social media, wherever you are, we are there as well. Here's the thing. Tax planning is one of the six areas of your financial life. And if your certified financial planner is not involved in your tax planning, I, you, you might, ha- you have the wrong financial planner. I'm just gonna because every financial decision that you make and and certainly every strategy is going to intersect with how well, how's this gonna re- result? Like what's what's the result gonna be on my tax return? And you've got to know that, especially even de- deciding on investment strategy as well or planning for retirement. And I always say tax planning is about doing two things. Identifying opportunities, so what what opportunities exist for you to pay the least amount of tax over your lifetime? That's identifying opportunities. Financial planning helps you know which of those opportunities you should yep. take, you know, use, and which, which ones you should in your over, overall plan. But then the second is to avoid surprises. No one likes surprises. It's almost like those stick with you. They stick to your ribs. Oh my goodness! Remember when I, I've heard this plenty of times? Oh my goodness! When we first got married, I, we we owed a thousand dollars on our taxes. I never want to do that again, right? <laughs> or when we switched jobs, this such and such happened. We had a tax surprise. Oh, it was so awful, right? Mm-hmm. Those stick to your ribs. You want to avoid tax surprises at all costs. Now we're talking about some unique tax surprises. We want to talk about how you avoid them. 
outside of 2021, the most common reasons you're going to have a tax surprise is you change jobs. When you do that, likely your income changes, but certainly you've got to fill out a new W-4 and your withholdings could change. Okay, that That's number one. Number two, you transition into retirement. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, there isn't just this normal withholding schedule, or you might think, well, I've got Social Security. They'll withhold taxes. No, the game changes completely. And then third is you've got a business or you have a side business where you've got extra income that's going to land on your tax return with no withholdings, and that extra income is sort of hard to predict what that is. So guys, how do you prevent these tax surprises? What is the solution? Well, we, we kind of open the show by explaining that the reason that tax surprises exist are because people weren't planning ahead enough. And so to, to me, tax planning, being proactive with your tax picture and, and recognizing those opportunities that you were referring to, Mike, understanding the things that are still within your power to change your, your tax picture. Um, you know, doing a tax plan or a tax projection, think of it as a, a simulated tax return sometime early, you know, while, the, while we're still in the same calendar year, there's still time to do something. The year hasn't ended and everything is just kind of set in stone for the most part. You still have influence. And so to, to me, looking at your overall financial life, turning over every rock possible to figure out what are those things that you can do to Im improve your tax picture, it all begins with a tax projection, which Ryan, you and your team are gifted in this, in this area for sure. Yeah, so now is the time that we start preparing a lot of tax projections, and really it runs all the way through the end of the year. Um, so, so like Josh said, it's it's a mock tax return. So we're we're dealing with a set of assumptions of what the rest of the year is going to look like. So we start by gathering a bunch of information, or actually a, a little bit of information. So current pay stubs, um, current financial statements if you're self-employed, and then just talk through projections of okay, this is where you're at right now. Do you expect you know, is everything going to stay similar to what we're at right now? Do we, and then we project out, mm -hmm. um, you know, what we think, you know, we look at last year's tax return and compare, uh, you know, capital gains or dividend distributions, you know, and other sources of income and make our best guess, you know, talking through the process with you of, of what this current year is going to look like. And then the fun part is we run a bunch of different alternatives where we can talk through, okay, what happens if you change this? You know, what's the impact going to be on your tax return and, uh, and plan ahead? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those alternatives are where you're yeah. kind of testing different scenarios, exactly. th those choices that people are facing. Mm -hmm. If I sell that rental property this year instead of next year, what kind of impact will it right. have on, on my tax picture? You know, some of the other uh, alternate scenarios that will sometimes run – have to do with business owners or those self-employed individuals because sure. not all income is easily forecastable, right? Yeah. You know, your paycheck, if, if you're on a salary, it's it's pretty easy to know how many paychecks do you have left, where are you going to land, maybe bonuses being the wild card in there. But someone who's self-employed, man, it, it's hard for them unless they, you know, have a long lead time on sales or something like that. It's difficult for them. So sometimes we'll look at different scenarios that say, well, what if your profit comes in here at this mm -hmm. level? And what if it's, you know, 20% higher and 20% higher from there? What does that do? And, and what we're watching for are, do, does your income potentially cross certain thresholds where some of the, the tax benefits to you begin to go away? Um, you know, you, you become ineligible for certain write-offs or credits or things like that. And that's just something to be aware of because to the extent it's within your power to keep yourself under those thresholds by contributing to retirement accounts or taking faster depreciation on a piece of equipment that you bought or, or something like that, the, the things that you have control over, we want to... We want to know what that impact is long before the decision has to be made so that you can be as thoughtful and planful as, as possible. I'm, I'm thinking back to the list of unique situations this past year that caused surprises. So advanced child tax credit, a tax projection would have caught that. Yep. Right. Um, mutual fund, capital gain distributions, tax projection would have caught that. Josh, I thought that's where you were going when you said, yeah, some of, what'd you say? It was pretty good. <laughs> so so uh, they're not forecastable. Right. We, Is that even a word? I don't know, but uh, we're going to go with it. Like and and how, how can you anticipate and project out accurately capital gain distributions? You cannot. 
You cannot. But for years and years and years, we've been telling folks in these projections, okay, capital gain distributions could be X. Let's build that into your tax projection and see what the result is going to be. And because last year there was sort of that writing on the wall, we could sort of see it and feel it and sense it. In our tax projections, we were thinking, yeah, we were forecasting, okay, your capital gain distributions might be a lot higher this year, blah, blah, blah. Um, Job change. Oh, my goodness. I mean, guys, when you have a job change, you've got to do a pay stub analyzer, a pay stub projection, which is Ryan mentioned, it's the very first step of that overall tax projection. Get us your most recent pay stub and we're going to forecast out, okay, you're you're, you know, 16 pay periods into a 26 pay period year. We've got 10 more of these paychecks. Here's where you're going to be by the end of the year, something like that. And we can see whether your withholdings change, something like that. You had side income. Okay, we're, this is going to catch that. You had crypto gains, losses. That's part of the tax projection process. What actual gains and losses, realized capital gain or losses have we seen? All of those, all of those um, surprises could have been caught during a tax projection and, and and proactive tax planning approach. Yeah, and even just life changes that you can, you know, that conversation around a tax projection, you know, oh, the Johnny and Susie changed, you know, they they they're too old to get the full child tax credit now. So there's right. fifteen hundred dollars that goes away compared to last year. Or Johnny or Susie aren't going to college anymore. They're no longer on my tax return. So there goes a twenty five hundred dollar tax credit and $500 tax, uh, child tax credit or family tax yeah. credit. So, I mean, that's a $3,000 swing that, you yeah. know, we have those conversations in the, the yeah. when there's time to plan and do something about it. So when do you do this? So when we're doing taxes in the spring, our financial advisors are also requesting pay stubs as well. And we're going to look and, and just get an initial blush and then have some discussion. But then typically, if you don't own a business or have a side hustle, you're going to want to do your tax projection August, September, maybe early October. If you own a business, you're going to want to do that October, November, maybe early December because you get closer to the end of the year and you have a better sense of here's what the profits will be on the business. So guys, it's all about being proactive. It's really all about comprehensive financial planning, working with your CFP and your CPA to do proactive, this proactive tax work and avoid surprises. All right, we've got more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Okay. Nice. You know, it's funny is when you talk fast like that, and then I listen to the podcast on 1.4 or 1.5, you sound like a chipmunk. A chipmunk. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. It, it's an acquired skill. Uh, my my parents used to tell me, okay, you got to slow down. You got to slow down because, you know, mom was the only one that listened. And, <laughs> uh, but now it's like I can go really fast at times. Yeah. So, yeah. That's that's great. Normal time. Normal that's time. When I, I speed you up. <laughs> uh, speed the speedy up. That's yeah. We have gotten some suggestions that the folks wish there could be different uh, speeds for each microphone. Yeah, Kevin tends talk at different <laughs> Kevin tends to talk slower, Josh very methodical, and I can be either good tempoed or very fast. So there's a little project for you, Lindsay. There you go. That's right. Well, I saw that together. No, it's it's not cake. These are actually advanced microphones that speed it up or slow it down. Right. All right. Let's get into let's. So last segment, we'll we won't jump into any other questions, um, but we'll talk about tax notices. Mm-hmm. And if this doesn't take the full, then we can, I, I don't know, just ad lib into it more with tax surprises and whatnot. And this one's thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Ready? All right. The the worst tax surprise out there. We're focusing on tax surprise, but the vor- worst one out there is getting that love letter from the IRS. That <laughs> that uh, that tax notice in the mail. What do you do when that happens? How do you avoid those? That's what we're helping you with right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KF2 Studios, Josh Gregory and special guest. Ryan Fair. Every episode of the Wise Money shows on the YouTube channel, gosh, plus a lot more content as well. The library is chock full. If you have a financial question, odds are by now we've made a video about it. So go to the Wise Money uh, show on YouTube. Search you go to YouTube. Search the Wise Money show. Subscribe to it there. Turn on notifications so you're made aware every time we drop new content. Leave questions there as well. Give us a thumbs up button if you like the content. All that sort of stuff. All right, we're talking about tax surprises right now. We shared the most common ones that, gosh, more people faced 
this past year. And then we just shared, what is it, the antidote, uh, the, the way to avoid it, and that is being proactive with your tax picture. I can't imagine anything geekier than that, but the folks that you're listening to on the radio right now love it. I absolutely love taking someone's pay stub, projecting it out, forecasting what capital gains, what if we do a Roth conversion, what other income it is. Now, what I don't like is you're making assumptions. And so there are right. times where you're going to miss it. You don't have actual tax documents right in front of you that you can read off of. You're making assumptions. And so it, it's, it's an imperfect science, but I love it. Yeah. Well, and there's a whole nother level of nerdiness too, where you're not just forecasting this year, you're looking years out into the future as well, trying to figure out, you know, where do I place this income? Where do I sell that rental property? Where do I cash out of my business? These events that, that have to occur now in, in this world of the secure act where you have 10 years often to cash in a retirement account that you inherited. Uh, when do you choose to do it? You know, you, you want to look at all those 10 years and figure out it doesn't have to be equal across the board. Do you make it a little bit more lumpy to fit into the right years where you can spend as little on tax as possible? But that gets into a whole nother level I, well, of, of nerdiness. I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. The, the multi-year tax projection. Yes, I, I, I'm in love with that tool. And you need a multi-year tax projection. Absolutely. All right. Let's let's shift gears. Tax notices. Can't talk about tax surprises without talking about the worst one, the dirtiest one of them all, and that is tax notices. Now, Ryan, I know a lot of people receive notices this year by when they shouldn't have. Yep. By yeah. accident, the IRS made mistakes. But let's first talk about, is there a normal rhythm to when the IRS sends out notices? Like, it, it, do they typically send out the f a first round maybe in May or July or not until the fall? Is there any rhyme or reason to this? Oh, I'm sure there is. I the first round, the first round, you're definitely correct on May, June. Clients are getting lots of uh, lots of notices uh, related to. Um, most of them are, are are unnecessary notices. I would say at this point, where it's just matching up payments incorrectly. Um, the state has been notorious this year for the state notice, of Indiana. Yeah, state of Indiana, um, that have just sent these these notices that are. That are bizarre. That like are they're wrong. Just, they're totally wrong, and they're just yeah. not matching up either client tax payments or estimated tax payments. You know, clients have paid four estimates, and they, the state is giving them credit for two of them. So then we have to prove that, oh yeah, I really did pay those other ones, or yeah. I did pay the tax due. You know, when I filed, and they have it in their system. It's right. like there's something wrong with their own computer models or whatever that are matching these. And they haven't figured it out yet. They haven't fixed it yet. Right. So all these notices, which these aren't, you know, human beings sitting down right. and typing out a letter to you, right? This is just automated stuff. And if it's all based on errant information, then yep. you're going to get the wrong letter and it's going to freak you out. And you're going to think, man, w what went wrong here? Ryan, what'd you do wrong on my tax yeah, return? That's most right? common. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, I guess that's step one is if you get a tax notice, Get help. Don't just pay. Don't just pay the send a check for the balance due that's on the notice. I'd I'd hate to assign a percentage, but I guess I will. Uh, I would bet eighty plus percent of tax notices that are that are received by taxpayers are not correct. Wow, I would have yeah. said probably fifty, and yeah. and but but wow, eighty percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so yeah, it, and it's. It's not like they're they're not necessarily just, you know, fishing to try to, you know, get people to pay more taxes. <laughs> it sure it's, feels like it, it though. Does. My goodness. It does. Um, but I think most of it, like Josh said, is right now the tax notices that are coming out, these first waves of tax notices, it's 100% computerized, 100% uh, computer generated. No human eyes have looked at the tax returns at this point when, when they're sending out these notices. And so, you know, and, and it's everything from... Uh, it's it's almost all has to do with withholding or payment related stuff. So somehow, if your employer didn't file your W two exactly right, the the state their computer system's not giving you or the IRS is not giving you uh, credit for the withholdings through your W two. So you get a mm -hmm. notice that says, "Hey, you owe you know lots of money plus mm -hmm. penalties plus interest." And you've got one month to get it all paid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
The other one, or, or I, I guess, well, <clears throat> as a lead-in to what are the most common types of tax notices that you receive, uh, Ryan, you mentioned um, payment issues, mm-hmm. and oftentimes those are wrong. And so, gosh, what's the lesson there? Make sure you keep a record of it, yes. keep a receipt of it. If you're paying it online, take that screenshot or copy your receipt, something like that. Uh, make sure you've got a record of it. Sometimes when people are making estimated payments, they just think, well, Ryan, you've been doing my taxes for 10 years. You've got access to my internal IRS record. So every time I make a payment, you can see it. No, you can't. Nope. Right. No, <clears throat> you you cannot. And so, um, but what are, I mean, the other really common uh, tax notice is there was a 1099 mm-hmm. that you didn't report on your return, and now they're showing it was all short-term capital gain or right. whatever. So yeah, 1099B is what, what you're referring to. Um, it, it relates to stock or crypto transactions where you're selling a specific stock. So a lot of times the gross proceeds from that sale will get reported to the IRS, but maybe not the cost basis for that sale. And so they just show, you know, it could be, you know, just make up a big number. If it's a $100,000 stock sale, you may have paid $110,000 for that stock sale and actually had a loss, but the IRS only gets notified, hey, here's $100,000 of income that you owe us tax on. Mm -hmm. And so you have to go back and, you know, prove to them, provide them the the correct information Mm -hmm. and they'll adjust it. Yep. So, and a lot of investors don't realize that it is actually their responsibility to keep track of their cost basis. How much did you invest in this this investment originally? Yep. Because that's your starting point. And if you sell it for something much higher in the future and you've got a gain there or a profit on that sale, you need to know how much profit there is. Otherwise, the IRS is just going to treat it as if it was just all profit to you, the, the yep. entire sale amount. Yep. And obviously that's not that's not true, but you have to have those records. I, even worse though, if they don't have cost basis, they often don't have uh, date acquired. Right. And so they uh, not yeah. only assume it's all gain, they all they assume it's all short term gain. Uh-huh. And that has even so what what are some other common tax notices, Ryan? Can you think of any? Um I mean, yeah, common tax notices, just other unreported income. So mm-hmm. a lot of times, you know, again, go back to uh, taxpayers say, well, I, you know, I didn't even sell any, I didn't sell anything in my brokerage account this year. So I didn't think I needed to give you that tax form. Well, you did because you didn't sell anything, but the, there were the, dividends, there was dividends yeah. or there were capital gains, mutual fund distributions, stuff like yeah. that, that you do have to still report, uh, that income. Um, every once in a while, uh, they'll want, uh, proof of different stuff. So it could uh. be, you know, your education uh, education tax credits, so lifetime learning credit or uh, American Opportunity Tax Credit, and you have to, you know, send in copies of tuition and 1098Ts. This one drives me the yeah. most crazy because this does feel like it's phishing. It's, yep. it's almost in lieu of an audit. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not going to send someone out and have them sit with you and walk through and have you prove things, but you've already provided the information and, and maybe your investment company obviously already sent them a copy of the 1099, but they want you to send it again. You yep. know, it just feels like jumping through unnecessary hoops. And in the meantime, it's holding up that refund that they yep. owe you. And and even if they pay you some interest down the road, it's still the hassle factor. Yep, for and, sure. and knowing that they're holding your money hostage, it feels like that drives people crazy. The interest rate went up to 6%, right? From 5% to 6%. I believe so, which, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, notices. When do you get them? How do you get them? Um, okay, we touched on on when. They they can come. First wave is going to be automatic and yep. a couple months in, so maybe summer. A lot of them will come out in the fall or maybe even in January yep, for the previous year. Yeah. Okay, how do you receive them? Do they send you a text? <laughs> do they do they call and <laughs> leave you a voicemail? No. So they do not text. Uh, they do not leave you voicemails unless they've sent you tons and tons of paper notices. But still, I would say they will not. They they yeah they will not contact you that way unless yeah. you've had lots of prior conversations with them. Yeah. So, so so it's, it's a scam. If it's if someone leaves you a someone, voicemail. Yes. Yes. Don't call them back and provide your social security number as evidence yeah. of who you are. And and they, the IRS does not accept gift cards to uh, Walmart for payment. So <laughs> you don't buy them a bunch of gift cards and send them to them. 
so so yes, it is it is mail correspondence with the IRS. They will be sending out tax notices uh, via paper and with the state. Um, and then what do you do when you get one? I mean, this is this is one of the primary reasons, one of the top five reasons you should be using a CPA firm and doing comprehensive financial planning. So you're working with your CFP because it's very easy. A client gets a tax notice. Ryan just asks us, wait a second, did this cl- did this actually happen? Did they make this payment? Whatever. And because the CFP was involved in the investments, was involved in the, the overall tax strategy, it's very clear you can resolve it pretty quickly. But yep. um, So make sure you're working with a professional. But when you get that tax notice, what, what do you do? Client then get it to the CPA? Yep. And what happens? Yep. Get it to us. We will We'll read through it and see what's going on. And again, if it's payment related, the as far as proof of payment, the unfortunately the IRS and, and state the the government does not just want a copy of a bank statement that shows uh, that you paid them. They want either the confirmation number so that they can go find that payment and apply it to your account if you paid online. So they want the confirmation numbers. If you paid it with a check, they want to see the front and back side of the canceled check showing. Uh, you know exactly when it was deposited. There's tracking numbers on the back of the deposits that they will again tie that check out with your account. So, so unfortunately, just the fact that you have a carbon copy of your check or or even a copy of the front of the check, they don't really care about that. They want to see the cashed check, the front and back of it. So, mm-hmm. so we'll start requesting that information. Everything else we usually have. You know, if it's they want to copy of W-2 withholdings or something. We have all that. Yeah. And then you'll do, you'll draft some sort of write-up or an amendment yep. or something like that, mail it in. Typically, what's the lag time? 60 days? Uh, forever. <laughs> yeah. No, and, if you're mailing to the IRS, it's, I mean, it could be, I mean, it is always going to be months and months and months. Yeah. It, and that's the pain. Ridiculous. Yeah. So be, be working with your, be working with your CPA, who's working with your CFP. And if you face one of these nasty tax surprises, have that team help you. All right. Thanks, Ryan, for being here. On behalf of Ryan Fair, Josh Gregory, all of us at KFG, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group, KFG Wealth Management, LLC, and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.